do it there. I'm also going to be posting those videos on my YouTube channel, which is going to be on this link over here. So that should be present for you guys in case you need to look at the old videos or look at my YouTube channel. Um, that's all in there. It's always going to be on there. All of your notes for unit one are also in here in PDF form. You can go ahead and print them if you want to, but they will be here for you when it's when it comes time to study for qu tests or quizzes. The, all the information should be here. That's why I told you if you didn't learn from just copying down notes, that's fine because all of your notes are actually on here, but some of you do need to be jotting things down so that you'll remember things, but everything is on here. All right, uh, we're going to begin today. If you could, please open your notes again. The, uh, those of you that were taking notes, go ahead and try to continue um, your notes from yesterday. And we're going to go ahead and get started for today. I am recording. Let's get started. So yesterday we talked about the policy making process. We talked about how policies get created in the United States. We talked about democracy and how there's two types of democracy, a direct and pure democracy and a representative democracy. The only difference is in a direct democracy, people themselves make the policy decisions. While in a representative democracy like the United States, people elect officials that make the policy decisions for them. So we know out of the three, out of the two types of democracy, direct and representative, the United States has a representative. Now, today, a lot of political scientists have arguments and debates about who has influence over our democracy in the United States, who actually has a say or influence in our government. And there's a lot of disagreements. And I'm not going to tell you which of, uh, which of them are right. But today, we're going to talk about three theories of American democracy who has influence in the United States. So these three models of American democracy attempts to answer the question, which of us really have influence over government and the policies or decisions that our government makes? So there's three theories of what kind of representative democracy the United States has. Some people think we have a participatory democracy. Some people think we have a pluralist democracy. And some people think we have an elite democracy. So this, uh, this is our topic today. You need to know the differences between these three models. I'm not going to tell you which one of them is correct because that's going to be up to you to decide which one of these looks similar or, or um, looks the most like what our government is today. Participatory, pluralist, or elite. All right. Go ahead and talk about the first model of American democracy, participatory democracy. It's in the word, guys. In case you forget it on your exams, it's in the word. It's self-explanatory, participatory democracy. A lot of people, a lot of political scientists argue that in the United States, each one of us have a, have a way to influence a government. As individuals, we have the ability to influence our government. Everybody has a way to influence a government and therefore influence the decisions or the policies that our government makes. You as an individual have power. You as an individual has influence over their government. So let's go ahead and fill this out. Participatory democracy involves broad participation as individuals. Everybody can participate. Everybody can influence what goes on in their government. It gives opportunities for all citizens to influence government and policy. It gives op opportunities for all citizens to influence government and policy. We as individuals have a say, we have a voice. We can influence our government and therefore influence the decisions that our government makes. Anybody have a question on that? So in participatory democracy, this is the most positive model um, of American democracy. People that believe in participatory democracy believes individuals in the United States, no matter how great you are or no matter how small you are, you have the ability to influence your government and you have the ability to influence the policies or decisions that government makes. I want to be very clear here. Participatory democracy is not direct democracy. This is still representative democracy. We are not making the policies ourselves, but we have the ability to influence the government to make the policies that we want them to make. Does that make sense? This is not direct democracy. 
the individuals are not the one making the policy, but they are given the opportunity to influence their officials in government to make the policies that they prefer. So this is the most democratic of the models. This is the most positive of the models. People that believe in this believe that a regular American has influence over his government, can affect change in policy. Now there are advantages to this. It empowers the individual. If you believe in participatory democracy, you believe that you have a voice, that you have a say, that if you want government to do something for you, you have a way to convince government to do so. And if government has to listen to everybody, if everybody has influence over government, then that means the policies that government makes will reflect the will of the people. So government policy will reflect the will of the people. If government is forced to listen to everyone. And if everyone has a say and everybody has a way to influence their government, then government will make policies that will reflect the will of the people. So I'll give you an example of participatory democracy. Sometimes government officials like in cities and in towns, they will do something called town hall meetings and they will invite the town or the city to attend a meeting so that they can tell their representative what they want, what they need, what their concerns are about. Show of hands, how many of you have seen the TV show Parks and Recreation? So in Parks and Rec, some of the episodes, or a lot of the episodes involves town hall meetings where they invite these people to attend these government meetings and these people have a way to express themselves to their government official so that they can influence the policies that they make. That's participatory democracy. It's not that we're making the policy, it's that we're given a chance to influence our government to create the policies that we like. So town hall meetings are a great example. Um, two words that you guys remembered from US history, ref referendums and initiatives. Referendums allow people to pass or reject laws. Referendums allows people to pass or reject laws. Like an example would be those of you interested in marijuana or marijuana legalization, Colorado had a referendum a couple of months ago, a couple of years ago. The referendum was whether or not marijuana should be legalized in the state of Colorado. What the state of Colorado did is they gave their citizens a chance to vote yes or no. And Colorado, the people of Colorado chose to vote yes. So now marijuana is legalized throughout the state of Colorado. That is what it means to have a participatory democracy. You're giving people influence over the government and over policymaking. You're giving the individual a, cho uh, a voice in their government, a way um, to influence the government. Another way that some governments, especially local governments have allowed an individual to influence their government is through initiatives. Initiatives allows individuals to propose laws. Initiatives allow individuals to propose laws. So again, that's a form of participatory democracy. We're giving you influence. We're giving you power over your government so that you can influence the decisions that government makes. So this was, I believe, a campaign um, in Oregon to legalize marijuana in Oregon through a referendum. There is a disadvantage, however, to participatory democracy. I know it looks, it sounds great. Everybody has a voice. Everybody can impact the government and everybody can affect change. Everybody can affect policymaking. But there are negatives um, to participatory democracy. If everybody has a voice, if everybody has a way in which they can influence the government, that's not necessarily a good thing all the time. So I'll, I'll give you the disadvantage. Number one, citizens may not be knowledgeable about the issues. Citizens may not have the information. They may not have the education. So what does that mean? If you have dumb people, if we let everybody have influence over their government, most people are stupid. If you let them have influence over the government, what that means is government is probably going to make policies that are not going to be very good. If you give the ordinary people 
influence over their government, these people might persuade government to make policies that are not going to be effective, that are not going to be beneficial. Because you're allowing ill-informed, misguided people to have a say in government and in the policy making that takes place. Does that make sense for everybody? So if we allow everybody to participate, that looks good on paper. Democracy, that looks good on paper, but not everybody's capable of making good decisions. And these people who are ill-equipped for that might influence their government to make bad policy. Next, the tyranny of the majority, also known as mob rule. This is not going to be the last time you heard of this. This is something that our founding fathers were scared of. They were scared of the tyranny of the majority or mob rule. So what does that mean? Here's what it means. In a participatory democracy where, people, where government has to listen to everyone, who always wins? Who always gets the policy that they want? The majority. The majority. So I'll give you an example. Let's pretend I'm government and we're going to decide what ice cream are we going to eat tomorrow. Let's say almost all of you decide that we're going to have chocolate. You want chocolate ice cream. So I listen to you. Most of you want chocolate ice, ice cream. But Diego over here is allergic to chocolate. He wants strawberry ice cream. What are we going to eat tomorrow? What are we eating tomorrow, guys? We are eating chocolate. It doesn't matter what Diego says because Diego is in the minority. We're going to force him to eat chocolate, even though it might not be to his best interests. In a participatory democracy where everybody has a say, everybody can influence the government, the majority will win 99.99% .99 of the time, which means the wants, the needs, the rights of the minority might be ignored by their own government. It's great if you're part of the majority because you always get what you want. But if you're part of the minority, then you're screwed. Government might take away your rights. Government might ignore your needs. In a participatory democracy, if 90% of you in this class decide, you know what? Government, you should beat up Diego. I have to listen to you because you're the majority. It might not be good for Diego, but who cares? Government listens to the majority most of the time. So we may have what we call the tyranny of the majority or mob rule, which is something that our founding fathers were very much paranoid about. And you'll see later on how they design our government to avoid the tyranny of majority or majority rule. All right, another model of American democracy. If you don't believe that we have a participatory democracy, some people believe we have what we call pluralist democracy. They're very similar, participatory and pluralist. It also calls for broad participation, which means Everyone can participate. Everyone has influence. However, the key distinction here is instead of participating as an individual, everybody can influence a government as a group. So go and write that down. Broad participation by groups. So instead of trying to influence a government by yourself as an individual, pluralist democracy says groups have a way, all groups have a way to influence their government so that they can influence the decisions or the policies that government makes. So groups, oh, by the way, another word for groups that our founding fathers love to use is factions, factions. People that believe in pluralist democracy believe that all factions should be allowed to exist. All groups should be allowed to exist, no matter what kind of group you are. You should be allowed to exist and you should have, be allowed to influence your government to make policies that you want them to make. It doesn't matter if you're a group um, that likes abortion or doesn't favor abortion, gun control or no gun control. It doesn't matter if you're a group that's interested in dogs. It doesn't matter if you're the KKK. In a pluralist democracy, every group has a way 
to influence their government so that they can influence the policies that their government makes. Again, the only difference is in participatory, you try to influence the government as a person, as an individual. In pluralist democracy, you're, influence the go you're influencing the government as a group. So in pluralist democracy, groups are allowed to exist and they're allowed to influence the government and they're allowed to influence the policies that their government makes. Again, they're not the ones making the policy, but they're given power over their government to, um, to convince them to make policies that they would prefer. Let's go ahead and fill this out. Groups are often formed around a common cause, around a common cause. Maybe you care about gay rights. Maybe you wanna make abortion illegal again. Maybe you care about dogs. In the United States, you are allowed to form these groups and these groups together, you guys are allowed to influence the government. All groups have a way to influence government and policy. All groups have a way to influence government and policy. No matter how big your group is, how small your group is, all groups have a way to influence policy. So what are the good things about pluralist democracy? What are the advantages? If we allow all groups, all interests to have a say, then government will eventually make policy that reflects the will of the people. Just like in participatory democracy, if you allow all these groups to participate and influence the government, then eventually, according to people that believe in pluralist theory, the policies that government make will reflect the will of the people because all interests are represented, no matter how big and small that interest is. No matter how big and small that cause is, you have a way to influence a government making it so that when government makes a decision, that decision reflects the will of the people. Another advantage, and this one is the one you need to remember. Those of you taking notes, put a star on this one or, or highlight it or whatever you need to do, because this is the one you need to remember. This is what our founding fathers designed our constitution around. Our founding fathers decided we have to allow groups to exist. That's why in your constitution, you have freedom of assembly, you have freedom of petition, you have freedom of speech. Our founding fathers knew that they have to allow groups and interests to exist, and they have to allow them to compete for government influence. Here's what they were afraid of. They were afraid that someday one of these groups will become too powerful and too influential that they're going to be, abuse that influence and they're going to be tyrannical over the other groups. So this is the beauty of pluralism. This is the advantage of pluralism. If you allow all groups to exist, if you allow all interests to compete for government influence, what the groups are gonna end up doing is they're gonna end up competing against one another. They're gonna end up counterbalancing one another. And as a result of this competition and this vigorous debate amongst these groups, no group can ever become too powerful or too influential. So again, let me repeat that. In pluralism, where all groups are allowed to exist, where all interests are allowed to exist and try to influence the government, inevitably, these interests are going to have to compete against each other because they all can't get what they want. They have to compete with each other. And as a result, that's going to stop one of them from becoming too powerful because they're competing with other groups for government influence. So let's fill this out. No group can become too powerful because of this vigorous debate, because of this constant clashing of interests. And these groups are all trying to compete for government influence. No, not one group can become too powerful. they will counterbalance each other. They will check one another. So evidence that suggests that we do have a pluralist democracy is the fact that what kind of groups exist in the United States, guys? Give me an evidence that might lead you to say, you know what? Yeah, we probably have a pluralist democracy, like the KKK. 
What do we call groups like that, that they're advocating for a certain cause? What kind of... They're one of the linkage institutions that we talked about yesterday. Special interest groups. Very good, Savannah. Interest groups. We have about like PETA, like the KKK, like Black Lives Matter, um, um, like um, the NRA, the National Rifle Association. Those groups are allowed to exist in the United States and they're allowed to try to influence the government. And right now, people that believe in pluralist theory believe that all of these groups are counterbalancing one another. Like, for example, the NRA which believes in gun rights and don't want gun control are competing with groups that are for gun control. And as a result, they're counterbalancing one another, preventing one of them from becoming too powerful. Does that make sense for everybody? Anyone confused about pluralism? So on your test, just remember, what does plural mean? Plural means many. Participation in the form of groups. That's how you remember it. Now, there are disadvantages to pluralism that you might not be aware of. Here's a disadvantage for pluralism. A lot of critics of pluralism, they believe that too many interests have become too influential. Too many interests have become too influential. So what does that mean? People believe today that a lot of these groups have become too influential over government officials. Like for example, the NRA is a very powerful group today. And a lot of our politicians constantly suck up to the NRA. So a lot of people are complaining that a lot of these groups have become too powerful and too influential over government. So why is that? What is it? Why does that matter? It matters because government nowadays is trying to please all these powerful groups because they don't want to offend any of them. So today, since all of these groups have become too influential over government, government today is trying to make everybody happy with the policies that they make, which results in two things, or which can result in two things. Either government makes policy. Can you make everybody happy? No, you can't. But government tries anyways because all of these groups have become too influential over government. You can't possibly make a policy that would make the NRA and the gun control groups both happy. Yet government tries anyways, and that results into ineffective, contradictory policies, policies that do not make any sense. I'm telling you this right now because some of you might find yourself in office. Sometimes the solution to our problems is not gonna be popular. Sometimes the solutions to our problems are gonna get some people angry. You're gonna have to risk getting some people angry in order to come up with a policy that would be effective, that would solve a problem. But today government is unwilling to do that because it wants all these groups to be happy. And as a result, it makes policies that tries to make everyone happy and these policies are not good policies, they're ineffective policies. So I'll give you an example. In 2010, Congress and the Obama administration passed this. This is known as Obamacare. This is the law known as Obamacare. And as you can tell, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages long. Why is it hundreds and hundreds of pages long? Because the government is trying to get everybody to be happy. It's trying to get the doctors happy. It's trying to get the people that want health insurance happy. It's trying to get the pharmaceutical companies happy. So as a result, this policy goes larger and larger. And for a while, in the very beginning of Obamacare, it wasn't very good. It wasn't very effective. It was full of contradictions. It was full of things that are not going to be good for the U.S. healthcare system. It's gonna get better later on. Obamacare is, is functioning good right now. But when it started, it wasn't very good because it started with the premise that we have to make everybody happy. And sometimes in order, order to solve a problem, you're gonna to have to piss people off. This is what's happening in government right now. They make these policies that try to make everybody, all these groups happy. 
and they end up making policies that are not good for the country. All right, so the, that's the first scenario. Either government does make policy, but they make policy that's ineffective, contradictory policies, not very good policy. Or what? What else can happen? I don't know if you can relate to this, but you've, you've ever had two friends, two of your closest friends fight. They have this little quarrel. And then one of your friend comes up to you and tries to vent to you and tries to complain to you about your other friend. But you don't really want to take sides because you want to make them both happy. So what do you do? You stay quiet and you start nodding your head. You don't say anything because you don't want to make any of them unhappy, but you try to listen to them and you just nod your head. The same thing happens in government because it doesn't want to offend all these groups. What does government do? Again, sometimes it makes policies that are not going to be very good, but what does government do oftentimes? I don't want to offend the NRA and I don't want to offend these gun control groups. So what does government do? It stays quiet and nods its head, which is equivalent to what? Nothing, exactly. No policy gets made. Because if we don't create policy, we're not going to get anyone upset. So we might have this problem that needs to be solved, but government is unwilling to make policy because it knows it's going to offend some of these groups. So policymaking becomes more difficult. I need you to write this word down or remember this word, gridlock. A lot of people complain that pluralism leads to gridlock, which means policymaking becomes slower, it becomes more difficult because of pluralism. Anyone have any questions so far? All right, let's go to the last one. The last one is probably the most cynical one, the most cynical view about our democracy today. It's called the elite democracy. A lot of people argue that today, not everybody has influence over government and the policies that government make. Today, according to some people, only a select few have influence over the government. The rest of us ordinary people, we don't really have influence over government and over the policies that government made. We're locked out in the process. Instead, only a select few are given influence over the government and the policies that government makes. So elite democracy, political power rests with a few. Not everybody, it's not participatory or pluralist, it's rests with a few people. So usually political participation and influence is limited. This is not broad participation. It's limited participation. We don't let everybody have influence over the government. We limit that influence to usually the wealthy and the educated people that we call the elite. People that we call the elite. So political participation and influence is limited to the elite. All right. Anyone have a question so far? Now, this might look bad on paper because only a few people have influence over the government and the policies that government makes and the rest of us are locked out in the process. But there are advantages to elite democracy. What's an advantage of elite democracy? If we only let a few people the ones who are usually the wealthier people and the more educated people of the United States who have influence over their government and the policies that their government makes, what is the advantage? Think. Here's the advantage. Um, sometimes, or oftentimes, people are too dumb to be given influence. If you let people, like in participatory democracy, 
if you let people that don't know the issues, that don't know what they're talking about, have influence over the government, then they, the government might make policy that's not going to be very effective, that's not going to be very good. But if you limit influence to a few, the educated few, then that means government might make better decisions. Because the people we're letting influence government decisions are the educated elite, are the ones that know what they're talking about. So as a result, we make better policies or government makes better policies in elite democracy. Think about it this way. If you guys are having surgery, you want an elite surgeon to fix you. If you're flying on a plane, you want an elite pilot to fix you. The premise of elite democracy is not everybody's opinion count the same. Not everyone's opinion count the same. People that argue for elite democracy would say it right now because of, um, because of what's, ha what's happening with the coronavirus, they would say that the problem with the government's handling of the coronavirus is the government is listening to people that don't have the expertise. They're not listening to the scientists. They're not listening to the experts. If you want to control the virus, you need to listen to people whose voice actually matters because not everybody's opinion counts. If I'm talking, if I'm trying to decide whether or not to have surgery or not, I'm not going to ask my um, math teacher because he doesn't have expertise. Why should I give him influence over that decision? All right. I'll give you another example. Some of you here who are more politically active probably have heard of the term Brexit before. So Brexit involves the UK, the United Kingdom, also known as Great Britain for some of you, those of you that are um, from US history. The UK was part of this organization of European countries called the EU or the European Union. It was a partnership amongst most of Europe. A couple of years ago, the UK government decided, you know what, we may want to leave the EU. You might want to break away from the EU. After being there for decades now, the United Kingdom decided, you know what, let's decide whether or not we should continue being part of the EU. So here's what they did. They let the people of the United Kingdom vote whether or not they should stay or leave the EU. What is that? What kind of, partic what kind of democracy is that? Participatory, pluralist, or elite? Again, the, the UK, the United Kingdom government, they, very good, it's participatory, they decided to let their people vote on whether or not they're going to stay with the EU or going to leave the EU. And the people of Britain, the people of the UK decided to leave by like a very narrow, narrow margin. They decided to leave. And guess what happened? The day after, the most commonly searched in Google the most commonly searched question in Google in the UK is, what is the European Union? So what does that tell you? They were given power. They were given influence over something they didn't know about. They didn't even know what the European Union was. Why would you give them the ability to decide such an important thing? So this is the advantage of elite democracy. You have people that are educated, influencing the government, and government will make better policies for it. All right, so here's an example, and you're going to see this throughout the Constitution. Some people believe that America was founded under the notion that not everybody should have a say. Those of you that are going to be voting for the president this November, because some of you are going to be 18 this November, you should know that if you do vote, whether it's for Donald Trump or Joe Biden or the other candidates, you're not casting your vote directly to Donald Trump. You're not casting your vote directly to Joe Biden. Instead, there's a middleman called the Electoral College. These are a group of people 
what we considered elite. And they're the actual ones that vote for who's going to be the next president. Your vote, unfortunately for you, your vote is merely a suggestion for the Electoral College. They take a look at it, but they don't have to follow it. They can vote for whoever they want. So that's an example of elite democracy where not everybody's given influence. Influence is given to a few. All right, let's talk about disadvantages. So what could be a disadvantage of elite democracy? In elite democracy, where only a few people have influence over the government, and so most of the people are left out, the policies that government makes may not necessarily be reflective of what the people want. So the interests of the people, the interests of the, the will of the people of the United States might be ignored. And these policies that government makes might only reflect the will and the interests of the elite. So again, the disadvantage is if you only allow a few people to have influence over government, the policies that government makes only reflects the will of the elite, not necessarily what's best for the rest of the United States. Anyone have any questions so far? Adrian, we'll talk about that later on, but usually they're, um, they're selected by the political parties. You have to be like a party VIP, like a former um, congressman, a former mayor. Usually that's what, what they choose. All right, guys, we're going to review for a little bit and then we'll take your quiz. So that you, you, whatever we talk about right now is on your quiz or might be on your quiz. So there's three different models of American represented democracy, participatory, pluralist, and elite. You need to know what they're about and you need to know advantages and disadvantages for each one. So participatory democracy, the question is who can participate? Everybody, all individuals have a way to influence their government. That's participatory democracy, broad participation. Everybody's allowed a say. What's the advantage? Government will then make policy. If it has to hear everybody, government will make policy that reflects the will of the people. What's a disadvantage? Those policies may not necessarily be, be good policies because you're letting people who may be uninformed or ill-equipped um, influence the government. So those policies may not be very good or they may be ineffective. Everybody good with participatory? Pluralists, the same thing, broad participation. Everybody's allowed to participate, but in the form of groups. Plural means many. So pluralism is broad participation in the form of groups. You allow these groups to participate. What's the advantage? If you allow all groups to exist and compete for government influence to debate one another and compromise with each other, the result is not one group can become too powerful or too influential because the other groups will try to bring it down. So all these competition between groups will uh, prevent one group from becoming too powerful. The advantage, or the, sorry, the disadvantage, sometimes some of these groups have, have become too influential over government, that government tries to make everybody happy, which can result in two things. Government makes policy that's not very good, that's very contradictory, or government doesn't make policy or has a hard time making policy because it doesn't want to offend any of these groups. Anyone have a question on pluralism? Guys, it's okay if you have a question. Probably someone that's too shy in the class is probably having the same question in their heads. All right, elite democracy. Influence over government is reserved, is limited to a few, usually the wealthy and the educated. The advantage of elite democracy is government can make better policies if they're being influenced by people who are more knowledgeable, who have more expertise, who, have, who are part of the elite. The disadvantage is the policies that government makes may, on, may um, only reflect the will of the elite, not the will of the people may be good for the elite, but not may necessarily be good for the interests of the entire country. Anyone have a question so far?
But here's what I want you to do, guys. This is not – I know it says 4 p.m., but it's not due 4 p.m. If you don't finish right now, that's fine as long as you do it by the end of the day today. You have two things that you need to do for me. Um, first thing is you take a little quiz. You can use your notes. If you took notes, you can use the notes that I have online. So um, over here on Unit 1, there's the Theories of American Democracy quiz. That's going to be for half a quiz grade. Make sure you do it. It should be simple. You can use your notes. And then this is your first homework assignment for me. Please, please write in complete sentences. After you're done writing down your answer, look back at the question again and think for yourself, did I answer this question well enough? Because if you didn't, chances are I'm going to be counting it wrong so that you're going to have to do it all over again. So try to get it right the first time. Look at these words right here in the beginning. Explain, describe, so that you can answer the questions correctly. Anyone have any questions? All right, so here's what we're going to do. Make sure, this is going to be the last time I tell you this, but make sure before class ends, you've already done the daily check-in. Okay, this is a synchronous day, so pick the synchronous one. Tomorrow will be Thursday. You're going to be on your own, so you're going to have to do the check-in by yourself. And you're going to have to do an assignment for me by yourself. Um, make sure you do your quiz. Again, due at 1159. And this one is also, um, this homework assignment is due at 1159. If you have any questions, tell me I'm Remind 101. If you have a question about the lecture or about Google Classroom or anything technical, you can stay behind. But the rest of you, you can go ahead and log off. Thank you very much for coming today. If you do have a question, just stay a little bit behind. I'll try to answer your question.